It's a beautiful day here in Telberg, Sweden. We have gathered 500 of us from all corners of the world, from all types of, all walks of life. Many are scientists. We're here to take stock of the evolution of, of the situation for the planet. We are taking stock. We are defining what we call the planetary boundaries that we, the humans, should not transgress um, on such crucial issues as water, oceans, forests, and of course the atmosphere, global warming. Many analyses are represented here. Some are more optimistic, some are less, less so. Um, one is uh, Professor David Weston, a leading British scientist. He has gathered his material to tell you a, a worrying, very worrying story. I think this story is it's important to listen to. And for you, it's important to, to take your decision on how you want to react and how you should react, how you should act in relation to history. Well, good morning to you all and thank you so much for the invitation to Tailberg 2008 and to the science workshop that preceded it. I'm immensely grateful to you, Boo, for the invitation and for making this possible. When Boo briefed me for the presentation today, he asked me, in fact, to be uh, radical. I wasn't quite sure I believed my ears when he said that, but I checked it out again 48 hours later. He said, yes, that's exactly what I mean. Stay radical. <laughs> He's always ready. Stay radical. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I think the boundaries of, of tolerable radicality <laughs> have to do with the anxiety states of scientists who dare not put their head above the parapet and risk being wrong in public. So maybe it's something about courage and radicality go together. Right? Now, to me, the word radical uh, probably means getting down to the root of the problem. Say it as it really is. And I will do that to the best of my ability. One of the things we need to be aware of in climate science is that there is a time delay between original research and publication of about three years. Original ideas come into being in the researcher's mind or, or from the data or the analysis or the modeling. And then that gets written up with a team into a paper that goes through a whole series of reviews. That then gets presented for a publication in an international journal. They may or may not accept it or put it on, on hold for a few months. Then it gets sent out to a set of anonymous reviewers, comes back, maybe re-edited, maybe sent out again, comes back, accepted, and then published perhaps two editions later. Then it's in the public domain. Oh, and then the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change is able to pick up the material and put it through its 18-month to two-year review, assembly, analysis, uh, editorial processes, out for peer review on that, back in again, out for another peer review on that, back in again, out to review through the governmental agents, back in again, and publication. So by the time the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was published in February 2007, it was about five years out of date. This is a real problem when the pace of change in the climate system is moving faster and faster and faster. It is now outpacing the delays in the publication system. The climate science group that convened for the two days before the, the forum, as some of you here will know, focused on the tipping points that we dare not cross, tipping points that push us into change that is intolerable for human civilization. 
The workshop was based on peer-reviewed material, and although perhaps two to three years in advance of the intergovernmental panel's work, it was still about two to three years behind the leading edge of current research. And my task today is to bridge the gap from the foundation that Johann Rockström laid and the others laid in that science workshop, and to bridge the gap from that platform to today's leading edge, some of which is work in hand, some of it only emerging in the last two or three weeks. Therefore, it's rough-edged, it's workshop level, some of it will be polished and corrected. But I think it's important that you here today have the best possible chance to see where the leading edge is and where it's going. Planet Earth, we have a problem. You know, back in April 1970, in the Apollo space program, on the 13th of the month, there was an explosion on Apollo 13. And uh, you, perhaps those of you who are old enough here, and some of you are, as I am, can remember being glued to the television as the saga unfolded. And those laconic words from Jim Lovell, uh, Houston, uh, we have a problem. Telling me they had a problem. Um, Gene Krantz, who was the mission controller at the time, reflects in his uh, storytelling of this. For about the first 15 minutes, we said, it's not a problem. This is a computer glitch. There's no problem out in space. We'll get this fixed. No, t no problem. And it took them 15 minutes of precious time to realize there really was a problem, that the moon landing as a mission had to be aborted. The task now was survival. And that changed the whole function of the mission. Today, planet Earth is a space capsule and planet Earth is Houston Control. We're all in it together. And it's taken us more than 15 years to think that this may not just be a bit of a glitch that technologically we can patch together and no problem. Planet Earth, we have a problem. And that problem is specifically the role of the accelerating feedback dynamics that increase the pace and severity of climate change and drive it outside the predictions of most of the models that we have running at the moment. They tend to work on more linear processes, more equilibrium processes that are appropriate when looking at the ancient changing patterns of weather and climate. But in this situation, the change is running faster and outside the prediction parameters of our models. So it's to the exploration of feedback processes and their effects on the climate that I want to present this morning as radically as I can. Let's start at the very beginning. The whole sense that the impact of the human species on the climate has really been absolutely minimal through this early stage. And we have seen from the early development of humanoids and then the first moderns and through here, really a very small population held in balance within the natural environment until we begin to move to around the 15, 1600s trading base, bringing in resources from other parts of the world, and then the discovery of fossil energy. Energy from yesterday, yesterday's sunlight, buried in the darkness of the underworld, brought to the surface and liberated for today's generation to benefit from yesterday's sequestration of atmospheric carbon. And that set off an energy input that escalated the population, which required more energy, which escalated the population, which required more energy, which escalated the population. Very interesting. This is taken from Al Gore's slide set, and I'm very grateful to him for permission to use it. But it is very interesting. Do you see here that the scale gets wider and wider from many, many thousands, as it were, per unit back.